Um, I want to talk to you tonight about personally securing a personal open heaven. Not just over the city, not just over the church, but over you. Okay? Because um, in order to bring heaven to earth, you have to personally walk under an open heaven. And so, um, we're going to look at that from the scriptures. John chapter 1 and verse 51, we read it earlier in the week. How do you enter into this realm? And John 1, 51, Jesus speaking, and Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the heavens opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay. What really was he saying? You know, it was right at the beginning of his ministry. Try it again. How about that? Is that better? Okay. That was right at the beginning of his ministry. And uh, he said, from now on you're going to see the heavens opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon me. You see, though Jesus was the, the Son of God, when he walked this earth, he needed angels to work, work with him. And uh, it hasn't changed. We still need angels to work with us. Angels are carriers of the anointing of the Spirit of God in many, many instances. And, um, you know... God can do everything himself, but he likes to delegate. He likes to delegate things to us to do for him. And he delegates an awful lot to his angels. Great responsibilities. And um, as the heavens, Jesus had procured an open heaven over his life. And wherever he went, the angels of God ascended, descended upon him, worked with him, and ministered with him. And... Um, he made this very clear right at the beginning of his ministry. Now, we, earlier in the week, we talked about Jacob. You know, Jacob was destined, had a great destiny. And, uh, you know, he was destined. From him would come the 12 tribes of Israel. He would form a whole new nation. And, uh, but he had some flaws in his character, you know. He had some problems and, um, you know, and he found himself running for his life. And most of Joseph's life, uh, Jacob's life, um, he was running from God. He was scheming to get his own way. There was a destiny upon his life. He had an inferiority complex because of the, what happened at birth, you know, and all of these problems and... and uh, he was worried about his birthright and he was cheating and doing all this and he was running for his life. And finally he comes to a place called, well, he called it Bethel and he lay down and he had to sleep. And when he was sleeping, he dreamed and he saw the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending. God was saying to him, look, this is what it's like. You can't control this. I'm controlling this. You've been scheming for everything, but this is how it works. It's not you, it's me. God was at the top, but he didn't come down to Jacob. He stayed at the top. And he was saying to him, he dreamed a dream. Behold, a ladder was set up and on earth, and the top reached into the heavens, angels of God ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and of Isaac. But he deliberately didn't say, he didn't say he was the God of Jacob. Because Jacob was not surrendered to God. He said, I'm God of Isaac, God of Abraham. And uh, now, if, if he didn't have an inferiority complex, he had it now. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, but God said, now listen to me. He said, your seed will be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
And behold, I will be with you and keep you in all places whether you go. And I will bring you again back to this land, for I won't leave you until I have done that which I have spoken of you. You see, how many times, you know, like God's spoken a word over your life, particularly when it involves destiny, right? God said, this is going to happen to you. This is what I've called you to. This is what I want from you. Uh, and this is what I planned for you. And you know it was God. You see, Jacob had all of that, yet he was still running from God. He still couldn't get his hands on what he knew at all. But there were some things that had to happen in his life before he could take hold of his destiny and begin to move into it. And said, I'll keep you in all the places you go and you'll come back to this land where you're standing now. And Jacob wake him out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. The first mention of the house of God in scripture was in connection with an open heaven. How many of you know that we are the house of God? I mean, this is the house of God as well. There's a corporate house, but we are the house of God. And from us, we should bring, open up a portal, a gateway to heaven for the people around us and bring heaven to earth into their situations. And you cannot do that until first you've opened it over you. Now, Jacob had all of these promises of God. And, uh, and so... God is at the top. He didn't come down. He didn't say he was yet the God of Jacob. And now, you know, there was a lot of activity, activity in Jacob's life. He was in control, manipulating just everything. But now, he comes to a place where there's a lot of activity. He can't control it. He's got nothing to do with it. These angels are going up and down. It's got nothing to do with him. He can't control it. He can't manipulate it. There's nothing you can do about it. God says, you know, when you get to the place, when you surrender to me, things will change in your life. That's what he was saying to him. When you come to this place, you know, he goes off and he spends 14 years working for Laban. And, uh, you know, his past catches up with him in the sense that the things he's committed. Now, you know, you reap what you sow. <laughs> he cheated his brother. Now, his father-in-law cheats him. He said, you worked for me for seven years and you can have this one. He worked for seven years and he got the wrong one, you know. <laughs> well, you know. <sighs> Very interesting. Something happened in his life. Something was birthed. Joseph was born. When Joseph was born, he came to Laban and he said, look, time's up. I'm going home. It's very significant. He said, in, in, you read the scripture. Joseph, my son is born and blown, and I, I, I want to go. I want, to, you, I want you to release me now. I want you to let me go. He'd worked there for 14 years, and it was time. And when the Joseph was born, something began to change in his life. And um, I want to tell you something, that the next 14 years are critical in the church. They are critical years. One, the Josephs are coming forth. There's going to be seven good years. There's going to be seven great years, and there's going to be seven years of difficulty. And if you're not prepared in the seven good years, Many of you won't survive the other seven. I'm going to be really honest with you tonight, okay? There are things that are coming on the face of the earth that unless we are walking in God, we will not survive them. And it's like, you know, you say, well, well you know, what about that? Look, quite a number of years ago, I was ministering in the city of Medan in northern Indonesia. And uh, these pastors had walked for a week through.
through the jungle to get to these meetings. And so we ministered to these. Um, we ministered to these guys for about 10 days, you know, just slept there in the church on the floor with them. We just ministered to them and just and sent them back. And, um, you know, it's like many of them have been beheaded over the last few years with, with the Islamic problem there. Um, and you say, well, you know, why do these things happen? You know? How many of you know there were Christians that died in 9 11? Yeah, lots of Christians. And lots were saved. Yet some died. How many of you know if Lot had stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah, he would have died? His wife was a bit slow getting out and she got turned into a pillar of salt. Now, there are things coming on the face of the earth today. Unless we are walking with God and have immunity, we will not survive. And the next seven years are very, very important for us to come into this place in God, the secret place of the Most High, so that we can come through to the end in the purposes of God. And the Josephs are coming forth. There's no doubt about that. And they're going to save much people alive. That's their function. But when Joseph was born, Jacob said, I want to go home. I want to get, go back. I want to get back to my roots. I need to get back. And, and so he set out. And when he gets close to where he finally came from, he was a little afraid of his brother and what was going to happen and so on. It says in Genesis chapter 32, 24, and Jacob was left alone. You see, Jacob hadn't resolved this thing with God yet. Who he was. What his destiny was all about. Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of his thigh was out of joint. And he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said unto him, What's your name? And he said, My name's Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. Now his destiny. Remember, God said, I'll bring you back to this place again. Now, no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hath prevailed. You see, Jacob was so determined now to have a change in his life. He knew that, he, you know, things had to change. The problems in his life had to come to an end. And, and he, he had to find a new way in, and to walk with God. And so he said, I'm not going to let you go, God, unless you bless me. I want to tell you today, there is a window open. And those who are saying today, I will not let you go unless I counter you. You see, this is the attitude that we have to have right now. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep taking hold of you and hold on to you until you touch me. And his thigh went out of joint, you know, and uh, it's like God changes his name. And uh, Israel, call him Israel. You know, in the Hebrew... Israel means he will rule as God. That's the literal meaning of the Hebrew. Now, all his life he's been manipulating, trying to get his own way, trying to bring to pass the purposes of God and his destiny and his birthright. And now God says, now that you've had an encounter with me and something in you has died, because from then on he limped, spoke of his natural strength had been touched by God. He said, now your destiny can unfold. And right now, destiny is hanging the balance. Just because you have a destiny doesn't mean it's going to be fulfilled automatically. 
in a time when he, God may be found, we have to take hold of him. And we have to encounter God. You know, there are encounters with God. You have an encounter with God in salvation. You have an encounter with God in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But there's more encounters than that in God. And you need to encounter God in a life-changing situation so that you die and God begins to come forth. And it's coming to that place, that God, that a place where God requires that of us today. You know, remember God gave Adam rulership over the earth. You see, how did Jacob come to this place? We know he wrestled with the angel. Wrestled. Was not going to let go. We don't know if that was an angel, but I don't think it was an angel as we understand it. You know, he was dealing with the Lord. And he was wrestling with the Lord. And in Genesis 32, 30, it says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. And he said this, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Peniel means the face of God, Hebrew for the face of God. You know, people say, well, you can't see God because if you can see God, you'll die. No man can see God unless he dies. That's not quite true. Something in you will die. <laughs> I tell you, you have that kind of encounter with God, something in you dies. And something in you comes alive. The new creation man comes alive in you like never before. Jacob came to a place of desperation. He was determined that he was going to find God. Even even had to wrestle with him forever. He was going to find God and he was not going to let go. That's the kind of determination that God wants from us now. This will not last forever. But if we catch this, great changes are going to take place in people. Great commissions are going to be given. It is a time now for recommissioning. New commissions in God, they're ready to be given. But they don't come lightly. Those recommissions, you've got to encounter God for them. And there are mantles, mantles from many saints of the past still hang in the balance. You know the mantle of Catherine Kuhlman has been divided up it's, it's, it's become many, many mantles and more powerful than she had. And those mantles are available in the realm of the spirit. It's not just one mantle now. She's died. It brings forth much fruit. Those mantles are available in the realm of the spirit now. like William Branham had. And when these people die, the mantle is multiplied yes. and waits to be picked up. And this is, this is there in the realm today. The angels that go with those mantles have already been assigned. And will wait, those, those angels are waiting to work with those who will pick up those mantles, who will be assigned those mantles. He was not the same person. But the Bible tells us as a result now he had power with God and a name that means to rule as God. His authority level and his destiny began to come to the fore now. Change took place in his life. You know, it's historically true that prayer has been the key to every revival in the history of the church. And the church was birthed in prayer as people waited before God in the upper room. And if you will seek God in prayer, fasting, and do what God requires of you, and it can be different with us, but do it. Something's going to happen. Remember Martin Luther? 
Martin Luther spent a lot of time in prayer while he was professor of theology at Wittenberg University. And during the winter of 1512, he locked himself in the tower of the Black Monastery of Wittenberg, praying over what he read in the Bible and what the Catholic Church was telling him. And they didn't match. And so he began to pray. He didn't have the reality of those scriptures that he was reading. In fact, his church was telling him that they didn't mean what he thought they meant. He locked himself away. And he prayed. He read the word. He sought God. And as the spirit of revelation overpowered him, he had an encounter with God. That encounter was going to change the whole of Europe and on beyond as the Reformation would spread. But he had an encounter with God in a time when God was bringing change, when a window was opening in the Spirit. This man encountered the Lord and the Reformation was born. He had seen God face to face. You know, God has many faces, many ways we can encounter him. And God came to him. You know, after the Reformation began to wane and a a new generation arose, the son of an Anglican clergyman was burdened over the godless state of Britain, where it had just gone into apostasy, and the church had gone into apostasy, and... and, uh, He was burdened over over what was happening. And seeking God, he was born again on May the 24th, 1738. And his name was John Wesley. He had a brother, Charles Wesley, wrote a lot of hymns, who got saved a few weeks after him. They began to seek the Lord. They were joined by a friend called George Whitfield, The three of them began to seek God. They began to fast. They began to pray. They would go out into the fields at night and stay there all night. Described sometimes it would pour with rain and they wouldn't move. They lay on the face looking for God. Looking to encounter God. Looking for something that would change their lives and change their nation. And they kept fasting. They kept looking for God. They kept praying. One day, no different from the others, suddenly God came. They described in some of their writings that they were in spirit for days at a time. They were taken to heaven. They were showing the future and destiny of their nations. This all happened so quickly in their lives. And it was like, oh... They encountered the Lord during a window of opportunity, of the change, when the time had come for change, a kairos time. And they began to preach Jesus. Hallelujah. And the Church of England or the Anglican Church closed their doors to them. So they went out onto the streets and started to preach Jesus. Oh, they had an incredible move of God. Thousands came. Thousands gathered in the streets. They would preach. And thousands came to the Lord. They went down to London. And huge crowds came into the streets. They rode on horseback from town to town to town, preaching. And wherever they went, heaven opened. And the resources of heaven, the power of heaven, flowed into the earth. And people were swept into the kingdom of God. A great move of the Spirit of God. That revival in England was so intense. You know, the French Revolution and the horrors of the French Revolution were happening in Europe at that time. But England was saved from that by three guys who picked up their destiny. And it not only brought salvation to the nation but it saved the nation from the horrors of the French Revolution. Just three guys who had an encounter with God. 
a window of opportunity came for them. We come down into the 19th century, the church was in decline and people left the churches in the thousands. Towards the end of that century, God moved upon men to seek the Lord till they found him. One of them was Finney. Another was Moody. Torrey. These men were motivated to find their answers for their generation. That was their motivation. God, we've got to have answers for our generation. We've got to find you. We've got to encounter you for this generation. And these guys were motivated, Tory and, and, and Finney and Moody. These men were vo- motivated by prayer and fasting. And they had encounters with God that radically altered their lives. And when that happened, the power of God came upon them. The seven spirits of the Lord began to operate with them. Incredible things happened. As God unfolded and opened the areas of heaven to them and the resources of heaven flowed through them into the earth. You've read many of their books, you know, particularly Finney's book, Incredible Stuff Happened. Put us Pentecostals to shame, you know. Boy, they had something in God that was so dynamic. But it came to them when a window of opportunity, a kairos time opened up and these men began to take hold of God for their generation. You know, 20th of the century, Los Angeles, Azusa Street, birth of the Pentecostal movement, all happens the same way. I could go on and on, take you through history tonight. You know, 1946 in the church, things had waned. Went too good. But in God's heart, there was a plan to release a worldwide move of the Holy Spirit. The Kairos time came around. A window of opportunity opened up. Man began to seek the Lord. You know, the 1948 move. Nearly all of them had encounters with God. Because the time, the opportunity had opened to them. God knew what was coming. There was such a drawing in their hearts to be a part of that and to find God's answers for their generation. Men began to get hungry for reality for God, began to seek the Lord. Let me just talk to you about a man who's very, who's very controversial, but a man destined to open the way into this whole thing was a man by the name of William Branham. You know of him. Now, there were problems with William Branham, but stay with me, you know, don't switch off. Um, it's very interesting that Bra- his ministry really started here in St. Louis. That's where it took off, it was here in St. Louis. And there are mantles here in St. Louis still to be picked up. And it's, it's like T.L. Osborne watched him minister and said, if he can do that, I can do that. But it's not quite that simple. (laughs) He was pastoring just a little church, you know, a a little Pentecostal church, and and that's... (sighs) But he sought God. You know, on the last day of May, in 2003, while I was seeking the Lord, a very high-ranking angel came to me and I'd sensed earlier in the day that I needed to seek the Lord. You know, you get that sometimes, that you knock on the door. It's just a desire or you feel a need to seek the Lord. And he's knocking on your door saying, come on, if you'll do this, I'll come to you. And so I I spent that day seeking the Lord and praying. And later in the day, um, you know, it was like this high-ranking angel came to me. This high-ranking angel, and I shared it with you last year, showed me a container, a large container with what looked like water dripping into it. And I looked at this thing, and slowly as this water dripped in, it overflowed. The container overflowed. And uh, I watched and I observed as the last drop, the drop just went in, and it was just enough to take it over. 
the angel then said to me, the fullness of time has come. I said, what does that mean? And this angel, was a high, though he was a high-ranking angel, he was very friendly. He said, you know, what does this mean? I said, he said, a major time and season is now coming to an end and a window, a new window of opportunity will open up. And uh, I said, the scene changed. And uh, he showed me what looked like a large incense holder. You know, sometimes I have them in the Anglican church, Catholic church, but like the large, but there was incense and it was ascending up to the heavens. And uh, he said, your prayers have been taken and the prayers of others and have been presented before the throne of God in heaven. And he said, there will be that you know that I have spoken to you. There will be a number of earthquakes over the next few days and you will know that the Lord has spoken and that angel vanished. Over the following weeks, there were four earthquakes around the world. Just that following week, four earthquakes. And I was reminded, you know, of that future event in Revelation 8, um, where it talks about the incense ascending and, and then the God taking it and throwing it into the earth. There were earthquakes and thunders and lightnings, a change of season. And... Uh, I was reminded of that which is yet to come. And I prayed about this and I thought about this. I knew this was a Kairos time that was unfolding and I, and I shared it with you that time. On the 31st of May, the last day of May, a year later, 2004, that angel appeared to me again. And he said, I appeared to you a year ago to this day. It's the same angel that visited me in 2003. And he said, the time has now come. And with that, he handed me a baby. I thought, the last thing I need at my age is a baby. And I looked at this. And my wife was sitting, just a few, and she said, where did you get the baby from? That's how real it was. And he said, this, this angel said unto me, take care of it. It is still young. It will grow quickly, but it needs to be nurtured. It's still in its infancy. It had two applications, one personally to me in my own life, but it had a wider application to the church. Something had been birthed and was now available. Two years ago, at this time, when he said that, myriads of angels were sent forth into the earth, particularly healing angels, but there were others, were sent forth and have been waiting now for those who will break through so that they can work with you. They were already sent. These angels have been trained in heaven. They've been prepared for this move. Some of these angels were a part of the last move in 1948. Not all of them, but some of them. And uh, you know some of those angels had a real bad time in that move of God. They really, because a lot of ministries went off and did all kinds of stuff with what the giftings they were given. Um, but they're available. And it requires people to touch God and encounter with God, which will change our lives, which will, um, what's the word? Groom our spirits for this next move of the Spirit. So that we'll be ready to be able to work in this way. Many of those who had encounters with the Lord and, and power to enter into the next move of God in the earth, you see, this is your day, and the time has come. You know, Elisha was a second generation of prophets. This move of God is just an infant. It hasn't got to maturity. It'll take a while. But it's available now. It's being picked up in some areas of the world. It's being picked up in South America. 
these angels are beginning to work with people in South America. We're going to see some tremendous things happen. But, you know, they've been released into the, into the world and, 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 and earthquakes. When earthquakes happen in the earth, it has always has spiritual connotations, particularly if they're very heavy earthquakes. There are spiritual implications from that. You look at it, you see it in the Word of God. And I knew we were entering into a Kairos time. A time was unfolding in the events and the calendar of God that had been reserved for this season. And you and I have an opportunity to enter into this. You see, it's interesting, nearly all those guys who were really God used in that 1948 move, nearly all of them have moved on. Nearly all of them have died. There's one or two still left, but not many. God spoke to me and said, when Billy Graham dies, you will know that it's finally finished. The two days are overlapping. The old move and the new move. And there's an overlap. Now, I'm not putting any time on that. Um, but Billy Graham was also a major player in that 1948 move of God. You see? And he is one man that never failed all the way through. Some others didn't either, but he was one of them that never failed all the way through. You know, Elijah was a second generation Pentecostal. He was a second generation. Elisha was a second generation of the prophets. He had seen what, how God used Elijah. And... Uh, but he also knew that what Elijah had was not enough for his generation. He knew that enemies were surrounding Israel, pressing at the borders of Israel. He knew that there had to be a tremendous intervention of God or Israel was going to fall. Enemies would surround them at every point. And, and Elisha knew that he needed more. He wanted a double portion, twice as much as what? Elijah had. <laughs> and twice as much is available today as what they had in 1948. More than twice as much. And Second Kings 2.10 and says, and he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. He said, you know, what do you want? He said, I want twice as much as you've got. You know, if he only said, I want half as much as you got, that's all he would have got. And he said, I want twice as much as what you have. Nevertheless, he said, so he said, nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so. But if not, you won't get it. I pondered over that for years. And I've, you know, there's all kinds of valid interpretations of what that means. But... One of the interpretations is simply this. If you cannot see the end of the old, you can't enter into the new. You've got to see something is coming to an end. Otherwise, there's going to be no motivation to enter into the new. And it's, it's like we are poised, you know, we, we are poised right there. If you can see the departure of the old, you can enter into the new. If you can see a new day is dawning, you have the opportunity to enter into it. Very interesting. It says like, in, when all this was happening between Elijah and Elisha, it says, 2 Kings 2, 7, and 50 of the men of the pro sons of the prophets went and stood afar off and just watched. 50. You know what the word 50 in Hebrew means Pentecost. So the 50 Pentecostals watching. Sons of the prophets. But watching afar off. Sadly to say there's a lot of people and ministries watching things but from afar off. But when this thing comes, you see, they won't be part of it. They'll miss the window 
it'll be the kind of wait and see. But if you wait and see, it passes. You've had it. 50 is the number of Pentecost. You know, 50 days were between Passover and Pentecost. We have to go beyond the baptism of the Holy Spirit to a dynamic encounter with God. We have to move from the Feast of Pentecost to the Feast of Tabernacles. There's a lot of teaching now needs to come forth on that. As good as Pentecost is, we've had Pentecost for the last 50 odd years through the nation. Is the nation any better than it was then? But nothing really has much changed. A lot of people are getting saved and you say, oh, God's done wonderful things. He has. But we're not making a dent on it. And Elisha knew that. He said, I've got to, got, I've got to have twice as much as you guys. either. Otherwise, we're not going to touch this generation. We won't have what it takes. He received his mantle and more, double portion. You see, when an era changes and people pass on, mantles become available, the previous generation. But not only did, do they become available, they are greatly amplified in power. And not just one, those mantles are split because they fall into the ground and bring forth many mantles. And the power increases on that mantle. Oh, there's a stir in heaven at the moment. I tell you, the angels are excited. If we, even if we are not there, they know something's up and they're being trained for it. And it, the, the, there is a stir. Very interesting. Elisha came down to the River Jordan. It's just where the church is poised right now. Church is still in the wilderness. It's not in the promised land. I know people don't like me saying that, but it's a fact. Church is in the wilderness. They haven't crossed Jordan into the promised land yet. And he came, you know, and the river was here, and he said, we'll see. Where is the God of Elijah? We need more. We've got to cross Jordan. Water's parted. Crossed over Jordan into a new day. And the church is right there on the brink of Jordan. You know, we said earlier on that it was only well, sometime during this time that Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of that older generation that crossed over. And uh, because it says they had a different spirit. You know? Angels of God ascending and descending upon Jesus. Angels play a very big part. They're going to play a very, very big part in the next move of God. And there's going to come revelation and understanding on how to work with the angelic realm. You know, the charismatic move, we've got understanding and so on, how to work with the gifts of the Spirit. That's fine, that's good. We needed that and we still need more of that to understand how to work with these now, you know, how to work with angels. Catherine Kuhlman worked with an angel. That's how the healings occurred. William Brown worked with an angel. Um, Smith Wigglesworth worked with angels. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, it says this, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. This is the anointings that were upon Jesus. Remember he said the angels of God ascending and descending upon him? This is what they were. And because of this kind of anointing, it says, and it shall make him quick of understanding in the fear of the Lord. 
He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of the ears, but with equity and justice he'll see truth. This anointing, this was prophetic of the anointing that would come firstly upon Jesus many, many, many years later. And when he said to the people, you know, in, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 17, Jesus said this. He was given a book to read in the synagogue and opened it to this place. And there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You see, he missed out just one little portion that was in Isaiah and the judgment of God because that had not yet come. Judgment is not yet. God's not ready to pour out his wrath upon the earth. There's going to be massive revivals before that happens. Okay? God's going to give every tribe, every tongue a true taste of the gospel of the kingdom in great power. So there will be no excuse. You see, right across the Islamic world at the moment, some incredible things are happening. Some of these mullahs are having appearances of Jesus. Many of them, Jesus is coming to them in person and teaching them in Iraq. This has been happening for quite a number of years now. Many of them, the Lord is coming to them in dreams, teaching them who he is. And there are many, many, many who are still mullahs, but they are secretly know the Lord and Christians and leading their people to God. You see, it's like the Spirit of the Lord, something is happening out there, more than what we're aware of. And, uh, you know, there was a town in northern Algeria, really hard, you could never get into it, a town, and it was difficult to get into. And um, out of the blue, there'd been a lot of intercession, but out of the blue, in one night, every person in that town was visited by the Lord. You gotta understand, these are, these are hardline Muslim people. Everyone, either in dreams or personally, were visited by the Lord. When dawn came, when dawn came, the whole village was saved. The whole town was saved. When Western missionaries got in, you know, they couldn't believe what had happened. And this one missionary said, well, we've got to find out why this happened. Maybe we can make it happen again. <laughs> you know, why did this happen to this place? Very, very interesting because in the, the first known Christian martyr among the Muslims was stoned to death in the town center of that town. And as he died, he said, my day will bring a visitation to you. My death will bring a visitation to your town as he was dying. Who knows how many things like that have happened we don't know anything about. Still out there, waiting to come to fire. See, God is moving. God is preparing many, many areas. Um, for a, and it's only going to take a little bit of rain on it, and it'll spring to life. And it's like Jesus said, gave him the book. He said, this day, you know, Anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, put it down. It wasn't time for judgment. Because in Isaiah it says, acceptable year of the Lord and the judgment of God. But he didn't bring that because it wasn't time for that. And um, all of the eyes were glued upon him in the synagogue. You know, 
This day, he said, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. The anointing was upon him now. That anointing which Isaiah, in chapter 11 of Isaiah, spoke about, was now upon Jesus. He'd already said, you're full now you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon me. Now, this anointing that Jesus carried um, is referred to as the seven spirits of the Lord, enumerated in the book of Isaiah. We've just read it, Isaiah chapter 11. Now, you know, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12, I think it's verse 12, it talks about the seven branch candlestick, you know, book of Revelation. Let me just find it for you. Chapter 1. In, in, uh, first of all, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, it says this. And to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace and peace be unto you. Peace to him which, has, which is and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. Why did he mention those, you know? The seven spirits which are before the throne of God. Then we read in verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And the midst of the seven golden candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to his foot. It was a resurrected Lord, standing in the seven branch candlestick. Seven spirits of the Lord. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5 talks about. Hmm, let's have a look here. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thundering and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of the Lord. Very interesting. Just four weeks ago, both my wife and I had an encounter. And in this encounter with the Lord, I was given a candlestick. We were in a car with people out of my past. Not all Christians, but people, some way past, some just out of my past. And we were driving in this car, home and we stopped, and there were some children, maybe, you know, late children in their late 10, 11, 12, children wanted to get into the car. And my wife said, you can't get in because uh, the car's full. And uh, then someone handed me a candlestick but it only had five candlesticks on five branches you know and someone in the car said why isn't it a seven branch candlestick and immediately I turned back to them and said because up to now there hasn't been the fullness of this thing but it is now available the next 14 years, and I knew each candle, each candlestick stood for seven years. The next 14 years are critical. God's going to restore the fullness of this thing. Let me just say something. We've got to leave our past behind sometimes. There's a new day dawning. What we've accomplished up to now is nothing to what's coming. Hallelujah. And all these people in my car represented the past. The children that couldn't get in was this generation of young people. You've got to open the car door and let them in now. But it's going to take the fullness of the seven spirits of the Lord to meet their need. I woke up out of this. thought, oh. Seven branch candlestick. It's now available. <clears throat> you know, Zachariah saw this day. 
prophet Zechariah, he said, Who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice when they see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Seven spirits of the Lord. See them in operation in the book of Zechariah. A lot. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. He said, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are towards God. So he's watching. The eyes of the Lord are watching. His angels are poised. Looking for people who will take hold of God in this window of opportunity whom they can work with. That encounter with God, like Jacob had, changed his life and opened up the heavens to him. And then, and only then, was his destiny finally fulfilled. I've seen those angels. They're waiting to break through. You know, Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3 says, Call unto me. And I will show you great and mighty things which you've never dreamed of. Things which you don't know about yet. Going to be brought forth. This is the day now in which you and I are living in. You know, this is your, this is your turn. This is your generation. These seven spirits of the Lord. You know, if you want more teaching on that, Sadhu has a, I think... He preached it in my church, oh, quite a number of years, been 10 years ago now, maybe longer. I don't have a church anymore, so it's that long ago. It's like, yeah, he preached a series on the seven spirits of the Lord. It is just, just is put into these other angels under them and there are myriads and there are plenty to go around. And they are waiting. Some of them are here, have the spirits of the healing in there and might. Some of these spirits of might. I tell you, there's a coming move. We're going to see miracles, not just healings. We're going to see creative miracles become everyday things until the media, it'll be old hat with them in the end. It's going to happen. You see, how, God, how is God going to reach the millions of this generation? It's got to be. Sick or healed. The gospel is preached. Many people have been waiting for years, like Jacob, for their destiny to, un to unfold. And it takes a long, long time. You see, after this, this when he had an encounter with the ladder, Jacob went out, it was another 14 years in the wilderness. It still took him a long time to get back to the spot. <laughs> you know, 14 years later. And, and it's, it's been a while. These seven spirits of the Lord, 
They're represented also by the rainbow in heaven. The seven colors of the rainbow, the seven lamps are all in the colors of the rainbow. Remember the rainbow around the throne? Seven spirits of God, the seven lamps. It is all there. And the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That was the prophetic anointing. The spirit of the Lord, Jesus said, is is upon me. He went, went through the others. But the spirit of the Lord is a particular anointing. It is the prophetic anointing. And we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of the prophetic anointing. I want to tell you, William Branham had something in his day under the prophetic anointing where he could tell you the name of your doctor, the, your number plate on your car, your social security number, and he said, oh, by the way, God wants to heal you too. He could do this over and over again. So that's a prophetic anointing at a much higher level. I've had occasions of that in my life. And on one occasion, um, I was in a service, and this angel stood right by my side, and he said to me, look at the wall. And I looked at the wall, and it was this writing on the wall. He said, read it out. And I just read it all out. Names, dates, doctors' names, times, da-da-da-da, da-da-da. And somebody screamed in the congregation, said, that's me. Everything you said, it's my life. They came to the Lord. That angel said to me, that's how it should be. Seven spirits of the Lord. You see, God sometimes gives us a taste of things. He sent them into the promised land and he said, look, the spies came back with it from the promised land and said, isn't this fantastic? Look at the size of these grapes. And... uh, the usher said, yeah, it's fantastic. He said, no, if you want that, you've got to go in and fight for it. And there are giants in the land, but if you'll go in, it's all yours. But we're not too happy to fight for things. We, there's a cost, you see. And sometimes God gives us a taste of what is to come to whet our appetite and said, that's available if you want to go in and get it. And God is saying to you, this is available to us if you want to go in and get it. But first, you've got to encounter me. You need an encounter with God. And that encounter with God will change you and prepare you to be able to handle these anointings. And that's a sovereign encounter which affects a change within you. Like Jacob had that encounter with God. See, the Spirit of the Lord, color red, there's a prophetic anointing over congregation. I always see it as a, just a glory, a piece of glory, red colored. The spirit of wisdom, which is orange. Spirit of understanding, which is yellow. Spirit of counsel, green. You know, sometimes I'm praying with people and I see a, cover, a color over them. Now you say, oh, it's new age. No. Not New Age. It's the New Testament. <laughs> okay? And I see color over them. Green, maybe. And I'll go to that person and I say, Your God has called you to this with the spirit of counsel. I say, God wants to, you to keep your doctor's practice, but he wants to give you the spirit of counsel with your, with your patients as well. A supernatural knowing and to counsel that person you see and it can be discerned by picking up the color and spirit of might blue now these colors only relate to what I'm talking about like like the seven spirits of the Lord they can mean other things in different settings okay but we're well, talking about the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of might. You see, David's mighty men were empowered with the spirit of might. They, they did things which were way beyond their physical capabilities. You talk about, look at some of the things they did, you know? I mean, it's, it was totally beyond. The three Hebrew children thrown into a fiery furnace, you know? 
covered in the spirit of might. Couldn't touch him. Couldn't need this in the days that lie ahead. Tell you. And, you know, you see it all the way through the word of God, the spirit of knowledge. It's the indigo. Fear of the Lord is violet. I tell you, what we need to see is that color over some of our services. When that angel comes into the service, I tell you, the fear of the Lord. People will be on their faces before God and they won't dare get up until they're right with God. That's how it works. This is what Finney carried. Charles Finney, the spirit of the fear of the Lord went with him, which was an angelic being, went with him wherever he went. Charles Finney, Finney had this anointing. This, this, the angel went with him. And wherever he went and that angel was, the people would come under incredible conviction. You read some of the stories. And God is about to release this again. Oh, you know, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. I really, you know, I really want you to catch this. I, I, I still got the burden for it and I'm not going to let this go until my burden for this is released. Even if I have to keep on it all next week, I'm going to stay with it. Because I, I still have this heaviness on me, this burden. Because it is the burden of the Lord at this time. He doesn't want you to miss. No matter what your vocation in life is, there is something for you in this next phase. No matter who you are. Okay? But it's not going to come by saying, Lord, I'll have it. You've got to take hold of God and say, I'm not going to let you go till I have it. And that's the difference. You cannot handle these kind of angelic anointing, visitations and anointings until God does a deeper work within our lives. And that deeper work comes when we encounter him in a new way. Many of you need a good, healthy dose of the fire of the Lord. Some of your hereditary problems will not go until there is a baptism of fire over your life. Some things we're stuck at. We can't get people through at certain things. It's going to take a baptism of fire to burn it out. God can do it. Not hard for him. We've just got to be desperate enough. We've got to want it enough. We've got to be determined enough. Take hold of God. And let's face it, you know, there are certain things in our lives which no matter how much we try, we don't get past it. Come on. That's right. That's right. Tell the truth to us. It's right. I mean, ministers are no different. That's right. They are human beings, you know. They're just the same as you. And you think, God, it's going to take fire, a new fresh flow of the fire. To, something can only be purged with fire. It's going to sit as a refiner of fire, you know. This is a sovereign thing, but we have to press for it. Some of the early Pentecostals have that, but we don't have it today. Very rare. And it's like, if God's going to open you up to this realm, there's got to be some purging take place by the power of God. And that happens when we encounter the Lord in a new way. You see? And it's interesting because Jacob said, Look, oh, I've seen the face of God and I'm still alive. Hallelujah. But something in him had died. He wasn't the same person ever again. Now God said, Jacob, I can make a nation out of you now. His destiny came into being. 
Hallelujah. Now, you know, I can't do this for you. If I could lay hands on you and it would happen, I'd love to do that. I'd lay hands on myself. It ain't going to happen that way. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, yes. You're going to find a lot of revelations going to start coming out on how to work with angels. People are going to be taken to heaven. God's going to teach them. They're going to come back and say, look, you guys, this is how it happens. This is how it works. That's not off this planet. You have these kind of things happen all the way through the Bible. You know? But the time for the opening of the books now, in a far greater way, is at hand. And with revelation, fresh revelation coming, with that revelation comes now then the power, the opportunity, and the grace to enter into it, which wasn't there before. And I wish I could do it for you. But you've got to change some things in your own life now. I suggest that you start putting time aside, which you've never put aside before, to start seeking the Lord. And if you say, well, my day is so busy, I've got kids, I've got this. Okay, get up two o'clock in the morning and pray till half past three. It won't kill you. You might fall asleep for a while while you're doing the praying, but you'll get used to it. Yeah, God looks at you. These angels look at you and say, how hungry are you? How determined are you? You can make time. There is 24 hours in the day, you know? And if you just give the Lord two hours out of 24, you're not asking much, is it? Lock yourself away. Begin to take hold of God. And say, God, I want this. I want change in my life. I'm not happy with where things are in my life. I'm not happy with my walk with you. I'm not happy about anything about me. I want change to happen. Jacob said, I'm not happy with my life. My rotten life's been like this for years. I'm not going to let you go until I get change now. Those are the ones that will break through. Those are the ones that the Lord will come to. It's going to take time. And sometimes you get discouraged because nothing happens. And sometimes when you begin to seek the Lord, things get worse. Because you attract the attention of the enemy. And he'll put everything in your way to stop you. He knows. But you've got to be determined enough to say no. I'm going to find something new in God for myself. I'm going to find an open heaven, at least in some area of my life, for my family's sake, for this generation of kids. I'm going to find something that will meet their needs. You're alive in this generation. This is your turn now. It's your day. And there's a whole cloud of witnesses saying, yeah, go for it. We know what you're talking about. Go for it. It'll happen. Boy, right now this whole place is filling up. The tail. With good things. Oh. I tell you, there are angels watching, listening. The theme that the Lord gave me was in Joshua chapter 3. Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow you will see great wonders begin to happen. You cross over Jordan. Now, I don't know how long tomorrow is, but it is going to happen. The fullness of time has come now. The old is passing, and the new is about to come in. We have come to the kingdom for such a time as this.
Let's just pray for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Mm. That pull that you feel, some of you feel a real stirring. And it's not just emotions, but there's a pull on you. It's, more, it's deeper than just, just emotion. It's deeper than that. But there's a pull. There's a pull on your heart. There's, yes, this is your opportunity. This is your time. You can do this. You can find your way in. You can get an open heaven. God is no respecter of purpose, persons. And there's a pull in your heart. There's a stirring in there. That pull, that stirring, is because God wants this for you. And it is the Holy Spirit which pulls on your heart to say yes, pulls you into this. There's, a, there's a, a, an earnestness, a desire. And there's a sense of urgency. There's never been a day like this before. It will pass and the thing will break and then it won't be the same. It'll be different again. But right now, there's a call of the Spirit gone out. If you seek me, you shall find me if you search for me with all your heart. Oh God. Why don't you just for a moment if it, maybe you just want to kneel before the Lord. If kneeling's not comfortable, that's okay. But just, just, for a, just for a little while, just I want you to get alone in your heart before God and begin to talk to God about this. Tell him how you feel about it and what you want. And, and, and just, just begin to do that. And uh, as you do that, the, the angels of the Lord are just walking these aisles and they can touch you and they can help but just just do this because I cannot get rid of this burden we thank you Lord oh God oh God God and God Jesus name Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Thank you, Lord. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're not past it. You're just coming into it. Some of you folk who are really getting older, God can take hold of you in His intercession, which will change with such power that can change nations change families he can open the heavens to you you're not past it ministries that have been in the ministry for a long time and there's such a dissatisfaction in your heart that's good that's good can't stay where we are we can't stay where we are 